In this podcast, you will learn about the PBS process. Let's take a look at what we mean by behaviours of concern. Behaviour can be described as concerning when it is of such intensity, frequency or duration as to threaten the quality of life or the physical safety of the individual or others and is likely to lead to responses that are restrictive, adverse or result in exclusion. So let's take a look at the PBS process. It starts with gathering data and evidence, such as behaviour records. There are many different tools which you can use for recording behaviour. When looking at the different tools available, there are four common themes of information that are gathered. The first being antecedents. When recording antecedents, you are writing down details of what happens immediately before the behaviour occurs. By recording information on antecedents, over time this can paint a picture, and you may be able to spot patterns of things that happen immediately before a behaviour of concern. Setting events are more global types of events, such as lack of sleep or illness. It's important to capture information on setting events, as when they are present, it is more likely that an antecedent will trigger a behaviour of concern, compared to when a setting event is not present. I'm sure we've all experienced an occasion where we have either had lack of sleep or been ill, and because of this reacted in a way that we wouldn't have had we not have felt this way. This is an example of how setting events can make antecedents more likely to impact behaviour. The third thing that we record is a description of the behaviour. When writing a description of behaviour, it's important that we record precisely what we observed and heard without giving an opinion. For example, the person slapped the left hand side of his head for nine minutes, compared to a recording of a judgement or opinion, which would be, the person was kicking off to wind me up. The fourth and final piece of information is something called consequences. This is what happens immediately after the behaviour. It's often information gathered at this stage, which will help us to understand the reason for the behaviour of concern. We will talk about this in more detail when looking at consequence strategies. Whilst reviewing the current data and evidence that we hold for the behaviour of concern, you may begin to spot some patterns. It's important at this stage that if we feel we would benefit from collecting information on a specific area, that we explore options of how we could record this information. For instance, if a member of staff working in a school with a child felt there was a link between a child's sleep and the likelihood of a behaviour of concern, then we may want to have a conversation with parents or carers to explore options of how we could record this information. So that's stage one of the PBS process. Stage two is completing a functional assessment. It's at this stage where we use the evidence and data that we've already gathered and explore this further with indirect and direct observations. Indirect observations are usually interviews with key people, such as parents and carers, to develop hypotheses for the behaviour of concern, which are predictions of what we believe are causing and maintaining the behaviour of concern. Once our hypotheses are formed, we would then complete direct observations. Direct observations are where we observe the behaviour of concern, to gather information to support or disprove the hypotheses which we have developed. It may be that during direct observations, we gather information which disproves our hypotheses. If this happens, then we would need to develop new hypotheses based on the information which we now have. Once we feel that the hypotheses that we have developed are correct, we can then move to the next phase, which is to develop a behaviour support plan. It is during the development of a behaviour support plan that we will define the behaviour of concern and what we believe to be the certain events, antecedents and consequences for this behaviour. Within the plan, we will include proactive strategies that will make the behaviour of concern irrelevant, ineffective and inefficient. We mentioned earlier in these podcasts that behaviour is learned and can be taught. So where appropriate, we may develop a competing behaviour model for the individual. This is where we look at the desired behaviour the behaviour of concern which we are currently seeing, and look at what alternate behaviours we could teach the individual which will allow them to achieve the same consequence with a more desirable and socially acceptable behaviour. Even with a good understanding of the behaviour of concern, on occasions we may not see the early warning signs. Because of this, 
we would also expect to see reactive strategies and responses that would be required to maintain safety. These are just some of the areas that would be included in a behavior support plan. The final stage is implementation, monitoring, and review. To ensure a behavior support plan is effective, it's important that before a behavior support plan is implemented, that everybody involved has a clear understanding of all areas of the behavior support plan. Once implemented, there should be ongoing monitoring and review where we would assess the effectiveness of the strategies that have been adopted and make any changes that are required. To ensure that the behavior support plan is effective in improving the person's quality of life, reducing their behaviors of concern, and the use of any restrictive practice. Now that we know the PBS process, let's look at improving our understanding of behavior. So far, we've discussed the forms of behavior, which is what it looks and sounds like. To understand behavior, you must understand the purpose of the behavior. What does the behavior help the person to access or avoid? Let's take a look at the five functions of behavior. 